We were recording the interview of Frank Alter. The interview is being conducted by David Morse <clears throat> from the Wright State University Veteran Voices Project. This interview is being recorded at Wright State University's Veteran and Military Center in Dayton, Ohio. It is 10.09 uh, a.m. on the 19th of December, 2016. All right, so let's start off with uh, when and where you were born. Okay, I was born <laughs> February 26, 1948 at Scott Air Force Base. Well, it's called Scott Field back then, Illinois. Okay, Scott, Scott Air Force Base. Um, who are your parents? Uh, and what, what, what was their occupation? Okay, well, my father and my mother were both from the farm in Illinois. My dad entered the Air Force one year, one day after Pearl Harbor. Actually, it was the Army Air Force, and uh, served as a combat uh, crewman on a B-17 in World War II. And my mother, um, during the war, worked in several places. One of them was she worked for Sure Brothers in Chicago making microphones and throat mics and those kind of things. So my dad's throat mic was made by my mother. Of course, they weren't married then. Uh, another place she worked was in a uh, LST, a landing ship tank facility, uh, factory, if you will, on the Illinois River. So her part, she was kind of like Rosie the Riveter. And my dad's part, uh, he flew 23 combat missions uh, from England to uh, Germany and places on the continent, shot down on his 23rd mission. And, uh, you know, two more and he could have come home. <laughs> but he ended up, uh, the airplane, it's, it's kind of a nice, it's a really interesting story, the shoot down itself. And someday I intend to write a book on it, on just that because it's so interesting, but short version of it, uh, there were 21 airplanes from the group that left Grafton Underwood to go to Schweinfurt that day on the 13th of April, 1944. And uh, as they crossed into France, not long after they were over France, there was an attack by about uh, five or six ME-109s, took out two airplanes, including the group lead, and so the airplanes re rearranged and uh, went on further in. And then when they got to the IP, the initial point uh, from which they head into the target to Schweinfurt, then about 15 ME-109s came into the formation. Now, the thing that you have to realize is they did have escort. They had P-47 escort. But when those that second group of 109s came through, the P-47s went after them. Well, as soon as the 47s left and went after the Amway 109s, Falkwolf 190s came in, 10 or 12 of them, and in two and a half minutes shot down six of the seven airplanes in my dad's squadron, which is in what their part of the formation was what's uh, referred to as Coffin Corner. So six of the seven airplanes were shot down in two and a half minutes. And the initial attack, dad's airplane lost two engines, so they jettisoned their bomb load, they turned around and they headed west. Uh, the interesting thing is, when you see where they ended up, they ended up in France. Uh, another airplane ended up in Belgium, and then the other four of them crashed right around the Frankfurt Schwein in that area between Frankfurt and Schweinfurt. Mm -hmm. um, the only reason I can surmise that my father's pilot decided to go that way is because he knew he wasn't going to make it to England. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he knew that it was ro gently rolling farm in France, whereas Belgium, it was pretty rugged. And the, the airplane that went there, they ended up bailing out of. But Dad's airplane crash landed in France. Wow. And, uh, and it was within hours he was captured. My dad, the pilot, the navigator were all wounded. And the pilot and the navigator were wounded pretty badly. And they, they knew they needed medical attention. So... They hid not so well, <laughs> if you would. Um, I got to see all this, by the way, because I, I met the person who helped them out of the airplane. Uh, but they were captured within within the hour after they were on the ground. And uh, Dad hid out in another place, and it was several hours before the Germans realized there was something going on in the building that he was captured in, and that's when they got him. So then they took him to the hospital in Nancy, 
got him patched up. I guess he was there about two weeks. Then they uh, took him over to Frankfurt to interrogate him. Of course, the enlisted guys didn't get grilled nearly as much as the officers, and so it was kind of a short deal. And then they put him on one of those trains that you see in the museum, that railroad car with the POWs in it. <clears throat> took him clear across from Frankfurt all the way almost to Vienna, Austria, because that's where Stalag 17 is, or was. So, pretty neat story. Wow. And of course, then they were liberated um, in May of 45. So he was POW for 13 months. Wow. Man, that's incredible. I'd be interested to see that book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so did, do you have any siblings? I have a, a, a brother who's about 22 months older than I am. He, um, his name was John. <clears throat> he went in the Army in 1965 and uh, went there because the Army would guarantee education. <laughs> so they trained him in computers. This is a 1965 computer, so we're talking computers bigger than this room, <laughs> you know, with punch cards and all that other stuff. But he, he served as a uh, computer technician, if you will, in the Army and uh, went to Korea and then he uh, went to Vietnam. In fact, he was in Vietnam right after my father was in Vietnam. <laughs> my father didn't have to go to Vietnam. He didn't have to go to Korea. He didn't have to go in the Berlin airlift. And they asked him to do all these things, but he had been a POW, so he didn't have to. Right. But by the time, uh, he, he was in for 30 years, and uh, by the time Vietnam rolled around, he was still in. Yeah. And he thought, why not? You know, so he went. <laughs> he was in Cameron Bay one year, and then the following year, my brother was in Cameron Bay. And then the following year, I was in Karat, Thailand. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Uh, quite a lineage there. Um, so, were you, uh, let's talk about your enlistment now, uh, or uh, how you got in. Um, okay, well, I was, <clears throat> I was in my second year of school at Illinois State. And uh, it's, it's a really long story because I started out at the University of Illinois and then I moved out to uh, Virginia. My, my parents had separated at that point about 1968. And, um, and so I went to school there for a while and then I decided, no, I need to go back to Illinois. So I went out to Illinois State. And uh, back then when you were in college, you got a 2S deferment from the draft. Okay. And then every summer, you got a, a 1A. But they knew that you were a college student, and as long as you went back to school in September, August or September, then you got your 2S back. Well, this one year, I didn't get a 2S. I got a 1SC. So I called the draft board. What is a 1SC? You know? They said, well, it's, you're next. <laughs> you know? I said, why? You know, anyway, it's, it's another story. So I go, I'm back in school in Illinois. I get a notice to go get my physical, my draft physical. And I thought, okay, th this is not going well. <laughs> so I go up to Chicago to do the uh, physical. And uh, if you've ever seen the movie Alice's Restaurant, uh, you know, anybody who has seen that movie will know what I'm talking about. You need to go Google it and go watch it. But uh, the scene that they have in the induction center for these guys, it was a, a movie about hippies and stuff. Alice's Restaurant, it was a, a seriously hippie film. <laughs> but the scene where they're in, you know, the guy's getting drafted, and the scene in that induction center was exactly what I saw in Chicago. It was like, holy cow, really? <laughs> there was some weird stuff going on there. But anyway, so I, I did the physical, went back down to school, uh, school was in Bloomington, Illinois, actually normal Illinois. And uh, so I get back down there and I go straight to the Air Force recruiter. Now my brother was in the Army. I saw how they treated him. I've been around the Air Force and the Army all my life. I love airplanes. There's no way I'm going to go in the Army. Right. You know? And so I went to the recruiter. I took all the tests and I scored very well on all the tests. And the guy says, you can have anything you want. What do you want? And I, my dad was a flight engineer, crew chief kind of guy, I wanted to fly. 
You know, and so I said, that's what I want. He said, but you could go into avionics, you know, because those guys are the really smart ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, anyway, so then the draft notice came. I come back to the dorm, open up my little mailbox, and then there's this brown envelope. I look around, close the door real quick, go back up to my room, call the recruiter. Hey, I got this brown envelope in my mailbox. We'll go open it. Oh, you know, I thought it was like a subpoena. You know, if you if you touch this thing, you know, you're you're done. <laughs> he says, no, go get it. So I went downstairs, took out the letter, opened it up, and sure enough, it was my draft notice, and it was greetings. You are hereby ordered to report for induction in the United States Air Force. So I was back on the phone with the recruiter, and he said, so when do they want you? Well, they want me on the 29th of May. They're not even going to let me finish the semester. He says, not a problem. He says, we'll, we'll uh, swear you in on delayed enlistment in the Air Force on the 28th of May. So that's what I did. I went down to St. Louis on a train, you know, and enlisted in the in the Air Force as a uh, delayed enlistment program. And so uh, after I did all that, swore in, got back on a train, went back up to Bloomington, went back to school, finished the semester, went home for the summer. And then in August that summer, 69, is when Dad and I drove back out to Illinois <laughs> from Langley, Virginia, and uh, went to went to the recruiter. And then from there, of course, they shipped me from there to St. Louis. I guess it was, yeah, St. Louis by train again. And then from St. Louis, they put us on an airplane, flew us down in San Antonio, and then off to basic training. Wow. Yeah. So that's how you were drafted and enlisted. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, so, <clears throat> how did uh, how did your family feel about you well, being in the military, yeah. in the Air Force? Oh well, you know, it's a military family. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like the family business. <laughs> <laughs> now there was, you know, there, there was no animosity. There was some, you know, the typical well, darn you, because know, my plan was to finish college, get a commission, and go fly airplanes. <laughs> I got cut short, you know, and so other than that, and it was kind of funny because at that time my mother said, you got two years of college, why don't you go in the Army? You can fly helicopters. I said, Mom, do you know the life expectancy of a helicopter pilot in Vietnam? <laughs> do you love me? <laughs> and, it, and it really wasn't that so much as there was no way I was going to deal with the Army. Uh, I was. Born in the Air Force, and I love airplanes, and that's just what I wanted to do. Flying helicopters wasn't one of them. <laughs> right. No, I can understand that. Uh, so what what ended up being your MOS once you finally got in? That that's or your so AFSC. AFSC. So Air Force Specialty Code. I think that's what they. Yeah. Got yeah, something like that. Yeah, Specialty Code. Uh, <clears throat> what it was when I'm in basic training. Early on, they pick certain people to go off to be security police, cooks. <laughs> Fortunately, my, I guess my scores were good enough that I wasn't one of those guys. But, uh, but they did take the rest of us down to this building. And they sat us down in this classroom, kind of a place, and they had a blackboard. And it had all the AFSCs in the Air Force listed on this board. It had the number and then what it was. And they told us, Pick three, put them in the order that you prefer them. You know, so I picked crew chief, engine mechanic, and I figured since I was jumping out of airplanes at that time, parachute rigger, because I could do that. Didn't get any of them. <laughs> you know, so we, we filled out that little dream sheet, yeah. turned it in, and then it was a week or two later, they took some of us over to another building where we were going to be interviewed. You know, I'm thinking, basic training? They're going to interview us, you know. And what it was, in my mind, it was a scam. Because you go in there, and they're going to make you feel real good. You're going to get the interview with a major, you know, that's like, whoa, you know. Or a civilian equivalent. It turned out it was a civilian equivalent that I got. But So we're sitting in the waiting room out here, and there's these offices around the, the sides there. And what are they showing us? They're showing bombs blowing up, rockets firing, missiles, and, you know, and guns. <laughs> so we're, you know, this should have been the first clue. So I go in to interview with this guy and he says, 
how do you feel about being a weapons mechanic? No, nope, want to be a crew chief. You know, why? Want to fly, you know? <laughs> he says, so anyway, he's trying to sell me this deal. And uh, long story short is he says, okay, he says, I'll put an X in this column here saying that you really don't want to be a weapons mechanic. Um, and I said, well, then you need to put an X in that corner. He said, okay. So as I got up to leave, I looked over my shoulder and he, <laughs> he did not mark that block. <laughs> so, so then I told my dad, dad, they want me to be a weapons mechanic. And I can't really repeat what he said on the phone. <laughs> But I said, Dad, they're not giving me a choice, you know. Uh, and so I ended up being a weapons mechanic and went to training at, uh, uh, after basic training, went to tech school at Lowry Air Force Base, which is, was in Denver, Colorado. Whoa, oh. what a nice place. Yeah. <laughs> but they trained us on loading, fixing, you know, all that kind of stuff. They trained us on fighters. Mm -hmm. uh, they trained me because it, you know, that's where they split up. Because you could be a uh, bomber, mm -hmm. you could be fighter, mm -hmm. and you could be uh, what do we call them interceptor. You know, like F one hundred six air interceptors. Right. And I ended up with tactical. You know, so I was on fighters, and uh, so you go through the tech school, and then you go to your first duty assignment. Now the tech school was all, you know, it had F one hundreds, F fours. F-105s, um, a couple others, and then F-1, yeah, I already said 100. And they had a mock-up of an F-111, because the F-111 was so new at that time, they didn't have a real F-111, so it was a mock-up. Right. I go to my first duty station, which was Herbert Field. The guy takes me out to flight line and says, here are your airplanes, and they had propellers on them. <laughs> it was OV-10s. <laughs> But there were OV-10s, there were A-1s, and there were T-28s, all of them with propellers. Oh, <laughs> and so that was that was the start of it. What time was what time was this that uh, I got you were in your training? Okay, training was from like September through into January of 1970. Okay. And so I left Denver in January of '70. Took a couple of weeks leave, and then I ended up going to Herbert in February of '70. That's when I reported in down there. Okay. And your your training base was a lot better than mine. Oh yeah. End of it, Shepherd. Well, and I've been there too. <laughs> <laughs> so you understand my pain. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's cool. So tell me a little bit, a uh, little bit more about your first duty. What was it? What was it like being there? When I got there, I was a two striper. That was the other thing I. I kind of left out, but when I went through basic training, I had one stripe. Nobody else had a stripe. Is this because you were in, you had some college? It was because I had some college and I had some ROTC, <laughs> and I and I guess because I had I was a dependent, you know, so I'd been around the military, so it wasn't like I needed to learn the really basic basic things. Right. And I was the flight chief or the dorm chief in my basic training flight the entire time. Uh -huh. The sister flight went through like six different storm chiefs. <laughs> but because I had one stripe in basic training and through uh, uh, tech school, by the time I finished tech school I had enough time and grade at that time to get my second stripe. So I had, and of course this, the system missed all this and so when I mentioned it to somebody I got verbal orders to put on my second stripe and then the printed orders followed me. So I show up at Herbert Field with two stripes on my sleeve. I'm there two, three, four weeks after the guys who were in tech school with me, and they're still with one stripe, and they're, they're saying, you can't be a two-striper. And I, I said, well, you just wait. You know, pretty soon my orders came through, and I said, there. <laughs> <laughs> but my first job when I was there was uh, the weapons business was broken up into three areas. You were a weapons loader. Mm -hmm. You were a weapons, uh, what do we call it, release systems mechanic. Okay. Or you were a gun mechanic. You know, so there was wow. loading, uh, uh, Maintenance. release, yeah. and guns. That's how they broke it up back then. Hmm. And I was release. Uh, so I worked on the, the OV-10s bombing system, rocket system, gun system. Uh, 
and in the same shop there was the gun shop guys and so I learned a lot about guns you know because we overhaul the guns or M60s that they had in the airplane at the time. Uh, what'd you do for recreation? Huh. Fort Walton Beach. <laughs> <laughs> and I was single. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was, uh, there was beach. <laughs> yeah. They're the prettiest beaches I've ever seen anywhere in the world. And I've seen a lot of beaches. But, you know, white sand, just pure white sand. Uh, and back then they had an NCO club on the beach. They had an officers club on the beach. You know, there was military government property on that beach. You know, so it was really kind of neat. But you know, the usual things that young guys do. You go out in the evenings and you dance with the gals and drink the beer. And, and then the funny thing was, at that time when you get your first assignment, now they want you to get your five level. Mm -hmm. In order to get your, and you know, there's a three levels which what you start out with, mm -hmm. uh, and then you got your five level, which is kind of like apprentice, and then your seven level. Now you can sign off things and you can do a lot of stuff by yourself, and a nine level that's like a chief. And so, to get your five level, you had these career development courses, yep. CDCs. CDCs. Yeah. And I knew I needed to get the CDCs out of the way so I could go play. <laughs> The other guys, their, their thinking was a little bit different. They figured they wanted to go play, and take a break and go study. Well, I knocked out my CDCs in well under six months and the first sergeant thought that was pretty marvelous, but I had a, I had a game plan. <laughs> now I was done. I didn't have to go back to the barracks and study. I could stay downtown and party, you know. And so, you know, there were, there were lots of things to do and, and <clears throat> The other thing about being at Herbert was when I went down there, um, I was engaged to the person I'm married to today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, when I went down there, I put a volunteer statement in to go to Vietnam. Okay. Because I wanted to go to Vietnam, get it over with, come home and get married. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a volunteer statement in. I'm not going, they're, they're not sending me. All my buddies in the shop had non-volunteer statements in. They were gone. Sure. This is Air Force logic. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, I got there in February, and you know, here we are coming up into October. Well, that couldn't have been October yet. But I, you know, I got tired of waiting. And so I, I called uh, my fiance and said, why don't we just plan to go ahead and get married? Because they're not sending me anywhere. And uh, so they got her parents sent out the invitations. We set a date, October 3rd, and uh, <clears throat> I withdrew my volunteer statement. I get orders. <laughs> well, as I said earlier, my dad was in Cameron Bay. They were, they were wanting to send me to Benoit, uh, Vietnam. <clears throat> and uh, so because my father was there, I had an option of saying no. I didn't have to go. This is what it was. I, they couldn't force me to go because my dad was there. Mm -hmm. Two members, two members right. of the family. Yeah. And so I said, well, you know, I gave you plenty of opportunity, so the heck with you. I'm not going. So I got out of those orders and we went ahead and got married. We got married in October 70 and I went to bootstrap. I went back to Illinois State on TDY to do another semester of schoolwork. And while I'm up there, I'm figuring by the time I get back in the summer of 71, they're going to have orders for me again. Well, I just got married. <laughs> so, well, that's, a, that's another story, but yeah, that, well, that's kind of a personal story, but we pre-planned our first son, our first child, our son, mm -hmm. and uh, she was exactly six weeks pregnant when we got back down to Herbert, and they did have orders for me, and I got out of those too. Now, my son was five and a half months old when I finally did go, you know, and so I went. And they knew that my brother was in Cameron Bay, so they sent me to Thailand, which was not considered a combat zone. And so I went to Thailand, and I got there during, right at the very beginning of linebacker. Uh, linebacker started in May of 72. I got there in June of 72. Okay. So um, <clears throat> when you got to Thailand, what what changed? Did your duties change? Were you on a different plane? Yeah. 
All of that. <laughs> All of that. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, before I, before they sent me over, they knew I was going to Karat, so they knew I was going to be on F4s. Mm -hmm. So they sent me TDY for 31 days down to Homestead, uh, which was near Miami, Florida. So for 31 days I trained, I did what they called C main in Southeast Asia, uh, F4E uh, training to learn the weapon system on the F4. So now after that training I'm back at Herbert and then I go overseas. But took the family home to, uh, to Virginia because that's where uh, my father-in-law was stationed at the time. And I go overseas and when I get there, of course I'm going to be on F4s. So we've got F4Es there, and I'm the foreman on a foreman load crew. So I'm not weapons release anymore. Now I'm on in loading. Uh, so they had foreman crews at that point. Back then they okay. had foreman crews. Uh, what did the foreman do? Well, I was a jammer driver. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> I'd never well, I'd seen jammers, but I yeah, we had jammers there at Robert. We just didn't use them on OV10s. <laughs> you didn't put anything heavy on OV10. No. But uh, so I was a jammer driver, and it was really interesting loading what we loaded on F4s. You know, we had, uh, you could carry 12 Mark 82s on an F4 with a murder on the center line and two turrets on the inboards, and then fuel tanks. Then you had the four AM7s and then the gun. Uh, and it, another thing that was interesting was how, how okay, load training. Load training in the States. It's pretty much regimented, you know, you go, down, you go to load barn mm -hmm. and you train to load that airplane, whatever airplane you're going to train on, and then you go do it, you know, after they certify you. Right. Okay, certification in Thailand during the war. <laughs> we go out, my crew, we go out to load rock, uh, Mark 20 rock eyes on this F-4 that's going to go over the fence, you know. And uh, so we load these Mark 20 rock eyes. I had never even seen them before. Put them on the airplane, pretty much like a Mark 82, you know, and do the arming wire and all the rest of that stuff. And uh, launch the airplane. The airplane goes, you know, to North Vietnam, comes back empty. So I, they signed us off. <laughs> that was our certification. <laughs> and, it worked. <laughs> and really, that's the only time that I recall anybody certifying us. You know, because that was just rock eyes. We loaded, you know, we loaded uh, the 500 pounders, we loaded 1,000 pounders, we loaded rockets, mm. we loaded missiles, you know, AIM-9s, yeah. AIM-7s, uh, loaded the gun, you know, did all that stuff. But that was the only time I recall anybody signing us off on <laughs> certification. You know, but I was, I was on that crew for about two months. I had a line number for staff sergeant. And so they decided to make me a load crew chief instead of being a four-man on a crew. Mm. So they made me a load crew chief and sent me to the 105Gs, which were the wild weasels. Right. And uh, the, di the difference was quite different because the 105, the wild weasel, all we loaded were AGM-45s and AGM-78s. We didn't even load the gun. Gun shop did that. Uh -huh. You know, they didn't use the gun a whole lot. But, uh, I mean, at that point, they didn't. Uh, they, had, they didn't have defensive missiles. They had offensive missiles. They had AGM-45s and, and uh, 78s, and that's all they had, that, that and the gun. Uh, that's the only airplane I ever worked on that I never went to tech school on <laughs> because I transitioned from F-4 to 105G. Go do it, you know. So <laughs> went down there, and I don't recall doing load certification on that one either. But it wasn't a whole lot different from loading uh, AIM nines or AIM sevens. Um, you know, you see it, and you you understand how it works, and you do it. Yeah. And and, in wartime, did you have to have your TOs out like you would in other time? Yeah, the checklist. Time? Yeah. Oh, you had just a checklist. Yeah. yeah. And you know, it wasn't like my next assignment was SAC. It wasn't like SAC where you had to actually have it out and read it. Mm -hmm. In SAC. You read it, got a response. Right. Read it, got a response. We didn't do that. You had a checklist, and it was in, you know, the jungle fatigues had these nice big pockets like BDUs, and the checklist was in that pocket, and we'd go do the job, and then you pull it out occasionally, and you check off this, this, and this, you know, put it back in your pocket and go on to the next steps. 
you know. So there was tech data, you know, you had to have all that. And sure. I do remember the, the 623s, the training forms. I do remember mm -hmm. um, my supervisor signing me off on different tasks, you know. Right. But as, as far as, <laughs> you know, I succeeded in doing the task, he signed it off. <laughs> <laughs> you knew when you failed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so let's go, uh, how long were you in um, Thailand? I was there for exactly a year, and uh, the war was over in January of 73. Okay. Um, and of course I got there in June of 72, so I wasn't going to leave until June of 73. So when we got, and there were a couple of bombing halts, you know, the fam famous bombing halts that the Nixon folks did. During the one bombing halt, which was before line, between linebacker one and linebacker two, we we halted, and so they told us go deconfigure the airplanes. Now deconfigure means take the missile launchers and bomb racks and all that crap off the airplanes. Hmm. They're just going to do training sorties. And I guess it was kind of like, see, we're we're not being aggressive. We take a air. well. I was just a dumb young staff sergeant, but I knew that. This ain't going to work, you know. And sure enough, uh, when the peace talks broke down in Paris, you know, Kissinger was doing the peace talks in Paris with, can't remember who the bad guys were, but, you know, the North Vietnamese guys. When those talks broke down, then we went into linebacker two. Mm -hmm. And there's a book written called 11 Days of Christmas, and it's about linebacker two. Right. That's where we were just bombing a snot out of Hanoi. Well, when, when we went back to it, we had, we had to go reconfigure and reload everything on the flight line, you know. And so, we had 24 105Gs and, you know, 12 on this side and 12 on that side, and they're all like this on the ramp. Right. And uh, so I kind of decided, all right, we're going to do this kind of like uh, Henry Ford, how you're supposed to do it. One load crew goes out, they check the airplane configure it, do the weapon systems, check on it, inspect the munitions, load mm -hmm. the munitions, do the post-load inspection, and then move to the next yeah, airplane. Complete one jet entirely. Yeah, complete one airplane. That was going to take too long. Because <laughs> <laughs> they told us when they needed it, it was like, really? <laughs> so what I did was I put one crew was going to do the systems checks, another crew was going to do the inspection of the munitions, and another crew was going to actually do the loading, and a fourth crew was going to do the inspecting after the loads. So we went down the flight line this way, and we were done within the time limit that we had. Wow. You know, That's so awesome. then we did that during uh, 11 days of Christmas, and then, uh, then the peace talks were on, and they signed, said, all right, we give up, we quit. Uh, so the war was actually over, and uh, so then we began flying training uh, flights. There were no live munitions flown, and uh, and then when it was time for me to go home in June, I went uh, went to SAC. <laughs> it's kind of like weird, you know. I was trained on fighters. Here I am on B-52s. Right. Can we take a break? Sure, absolutely. We're gonna take a short pause. Okay, we're coming back from our break. All right, go ahead. Ooh. All right, so in June of 73, I left Thailand and uh, ended up at uh, Fairchild Air Force Base in Washington on B-52Gs. Way too many motors. <laughs> <laughs> Being used to fighters, you know, and walk, doing a walk around on a B-52 was like, maybe I need to pack a lunch. But when I got there, I was assigned to a load crew. SAC does it a little bit differently because, as I said, in TAC you had loading, weapons release, and gunshot. In SAC, you have a load crew, they do it all. <laughs> you know, so you fix it, you load it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, kind of a thing. And, and uh, when I first got there, there were no B-52s because all the B-52s were still on Guam, you know, following the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the B-52s didn't come back to, this was 
summer of 73, the P-52s didn't come back until the Yom Kippur War, which was in October of that year. Uh, in the meantime, they'd send us over to Ellsworth, uh, South Dakota for training, for load training. So we'd go over to Ellsworth two or three times and load train. And then in October of 73, the Yom Kippur War kicked off, worldwide alert, they brought our B-52s back. And uh, so now we had our own airplanes. And I remember we, we had to generate our alert pad. You know, so we had to stand up our nuclear alert posture. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was quite some doing because the aircraft hadn't been used in a nuclear mission for a long time. And uh, so we're doing the systems checks. And on the B-52, it was called a Critical Circuits Maintenance Check, CCMC. And you have two bomb bays and a B-52. So you do a CCMC in the forward bay and a CCMC in the aft bay before you can load anything. Well, in the process of doing these checkouts, you're resetting circuit breakers. Well, some of those circuit breakers were so old and not used and very often they'd come off in your hand or come out in your hand. You know, it's like, whoa, you know, so now you got to replace the circuit breaker. Uh, there were several things like that. But long story short is my crew happened to be pretty good <laughs> with, and I wasn't the crew chief. I was the number two man, which meant I read the checklist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. SAC, you had five guys. Wow. On a load crew. Oh, man. Yeah, so I was number two out of a five-man crew. Um, but our crew was so good at doing what we did that we actually generated the first five airplanes on the alert pad at Fairchild. It's kind of like, well, these guys are good. Let's stick with them. And we had five or six other load crews, you know, <laughs> but we did, we did all that work. Wow. And SAC was really interesting because we did... We did train, you know, we went over to Ellsworth to load train. So you actually went to the load barn and you did the training. But the neat thing about SAC, if there's any neat things about SAC, was the way they trained you mm -hmm. was the way you did it. Right. You didn't deviate, mm -hmm. you know. And so that was kind of refreshing. You knew what to expect. Uh, but, you know, we had on the aircraft at the, when, I, when we first got the airplanes back, we got certified on loading uh, B-28 bombs, uh, nuclear weapons in the forward bay in a four bomb clip. And in the aft bay, you had four quail missiles, and those are decoy missiles. They'd launch that missile when they got into bad territory, and it would, it would send out the kind of signals that told the enemy there were 10 B-52s up there. So which one of those is the actual B-52? Uh -huh. That's what the, the purpose of them. We also had hound dog missiles under the wings. And uh, those hound dog missiles were kind of like the forerunner of the nuclear cruise missile. You would launch it off the airplane and, and it would go get the target, you know, and I I want to say it had a 500 mile range, you know, so you could really stand off with that one, send that in. Uh, that's what we had when I first got there. And while I was there, they took those out of service, part of the SALT agreement. <laughs> We have one in the museum. Um, and then we went to SRAM missiles. And then the SRAM missiles are now gone because now we've got cruise missiles. <laughs> so, but I was, at, I was there when I did my first re-enlistment. You know, so I'd been in the Air Force for four years, re-enlisted, sent me right back to Karat. <laughs> and so they were going to send me on, over there to work on A7s. And I said, but I'm already certified on two, two of the three airplanes that are there, the F-4s and the 105s. Oh, but you're pet-coated to A-7s. So they spent 27 days of my life down in England, Louisiana, England Air Force Base, Louisiana, it doesn't exist anymore, trained on A-7Ds. So, and that's when I got to thinking, I could do what that instructor's doing. <laughs> That's another part of the story. But so <clears throat> before I went overseas, I applied for instructor duty when I came back. So I ended up teaching the F-15, which was brand new then. Mm -hmm. But so I go back to Karat, put on my old jungle fatigues, my old jungle fatigues in addition to my rank and name and U.S. Air Force, I've got a thud patch on it. 
you know, it's a 105 patch. Okay. It's it's an arrowhead with a the silhouette of a, from the top of a 105G, and it says Thunder Chief or Thud. Mine says Thud, because that was a popular name for the Thunder Chief. <laughs> and uh, so I, I go into the uh, the orderly room like this. <laughs> And the guys looked at me and said, you've got 105 experience? And they grabbed me and they took me down to 105. And I said, there you are. <laughs> you know? And so I finished, uh, I worked on the thuds until we brought them out of Southeast Asia in November of 74. So, and that was kind of cool because I had a TDY from Thailand to Hawaii. Oh, nice. <laughs> we put one team in Guam and, and my team was in uh, Hawaii and the thuds cycled through both places um, and then went back to the States. And so after we got the thuds back into the States, then I, of course, went back to finish up my my tour at uh, Karat. And, of course, I ended up on A7s. But I could have just as easily ended up on F4s. But I went to A7s, and uh, it was a pretty neat airplane, very reliable. You could load everything, including the kitchen sink on it. <laughs> I mean, you could... You could load anything on this airplane, but it was very reliable. And uh, and I was there doing that when the Cambodians hijacked our boat, the Mayaguez. And that was April of 75. And so one day, part of the story is, even though we're not in combat anymore, we still had a Sandy Alert. Sandy Alert was to go rescue, fly cover while we recovered pilots, air crew. And uh, so we had A7s that were on Sandy Alert. They were loaded with live munitions. We weren't allowed to fly live munitions in Thailand at the time because we're not at war anymore. Mm -hmm. But we had these on alert live munitions. So one day I'm going to work and as I'm walking in the hangar, walking and talking with a friend of mine, we see A7s take off and they've got Live ordnance on them. We're thinking, what's this? You know. Well, about that time, our lieutenant comes in. She was among the very first female maintenance officers in the Air Force. Cindy Cardia, Second Lieutenant Cindy Cardia. She says, "Get everybody in here and stay in the no shift change until I get back." So she was going to a meeting, and the meeting was to you know, figure out how we're going to support getting that boat back. It was down around Koh Tang Island. Uh, south of Cambodia and so she comes back in long story short we got to load everything we got we got to load it now you know everything if it's not broke it's getting loaded it's gonna fly so we went out and loaded rockets and gun and uh, they were CBU 30s and what they were is they look like coffins <laughs> but they had these canisters in them that had gas in them Okay. And it was a debilitating kind of gas. It wasn't a killing kind of gas. And so what what happened now is our guys would fly down to uh, the area where the boat was, and there were a bunch of other airplanes down there. I mean, everybody in Thailand was down there because we were now out of Vietnam. So everybody in Thailand was down there, and we had five or six bases in Thailand. So you, you have, I don't think we had B-52s on scene, but we had everything else. We had AC-130 gunships, we had F-4s, A-7s, and probably the Navy was in there, you know, off of a ship if, if they were close enough at that time. Um, but what our guys did, and it was really interesting down at the end of the runway when they came back, because the pilots are going to tell you everything. <laughs> so we got the comm plugged in, and, and I'm the load crew chief, you know, so I'm the guy on the comm talking to the pilot while my guys are de-arming the airplane. And uh, what they were doing is, they would find these little sampans, little boats down there, and they didn't, we didn't know where the crew was. We didn't know where the American crew was. So you didn't want to kill these guys. Mm -hmm. So the first thing they do is 20 millimeters strafe across the front of the ship. That's the international signal, stop. They didn't stop. So the next pass, you gas them. So they poop out a couple of things of gas on these guys, and then they fly around and look at them, and they're all puking over the side of the boat, and the boat's kind of drifting. Well, 20 minutes later, they get their senses back and the boat's not back under power, and they do it again. So that's what our guys are doing down there. Um, but we've eventually found, you know, we put Marines on Kotang Island, 
fact, a very good friend of mine that I worked with in the F-22 office here was one of those Marines. He was a Marine sniper. Mm -hmm. He was on Kotang Island, had the bad guys in his sights, wasn't given permission to shoot. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, we got our guys back, got the boat back, and you know, that was pretty much the end of the, uh, well, there's a lot more to it. I mean, there were people killed. Mm -hmm. um, we lost one of the helicopters crashed with a bunch of guys on it. Mm -hmm. And then there were some uh, Marines and uh, I don't know if any other airmen were killed on the island at Koh Tang with the gun, you know, the gunfight that was going on. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't as simple as I'm making it out to be. Right, right. Because there were lives lost. But we got the boat back, got the crews back, and that's, that's what the military is all about. Mm -hmm. You know, and yes, some people give their lives. And that's why people, people today do not understand the cost of freedom. Those people gave their lives for the freedom of those Americans on that boat. Right. That's what it's about. So anyway, then it wasn't, you know, we we're starting to close the bases in Thailand because this was about April of 75. And so they were giving some of us rollbacks on our tours. I was supposed to be there until August uh, of 75, but I actually, or I think I was supposed to be there until September. And uh, I actually left 31 days early, which is, woohoo, you know, I'm going home. <laughs> so I went home, and this time I ended up getting that instructor job uh, teaching F 15 weapons at Langley. And that was my last enlisted job. So I, the F 15 was brand spanking new. The only base I had them at that time was Luke, and that was the training base. And then Langley was the first operational base to get them. And so I taught the weapon system there at Langley for two and a half years going to night school to finish my degree mm -hmm. and uh, I mean it was I we taught two classes a day one from six in the morning till noon another one from noon till six in the evening and so I taught the morning shift so I'm at the podium at six in the morning teach until noon do a couple of hours of paperwork and then drive clear across town to Newport News because this is at Langley Air Force Base Newport News to take a couple of courses. I get home about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. I'm back at the podium at six in the morning. <laughs> Did all over. But we were young then, we could do it. So I got to where I could finish my degree with 30 more hours. And then I qualified for bootstrap terminal TDY. And, uh, and I got accepted. So I, I went off back, you know, packed up the family. And by now our son was like four, maybe, six or seven years old, because I think he was going into kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So we moved out to uh, Illinois, went back to Illinois State, finished up my degree, and uh, then we pre-planned our second kid, <laughs> our daughter, because it was kind of like we knew that I wasn't going to be overseas for a while, because after bootstrap, I was going to OTS for three months, mm -hmm. then I was going to go to training for another three months, and then I was going to go to my first duty assignment, which was already stateside. You know, they had already picked that. So we knew we were going to be in the States for a while. So we decided, where do you want her born? So I figured, she said, why not Colorado? And, and so I figured, okay, I'm going to be in Colorado from September to December of uh, 78. And uh, so she picked October and you know, somewhere in between there. <laughs> <laughs> Looked at the calendar, <laughs> made it happen, and sure enough, Emily was born in October. Oh wow! <laughs> in Army in Fitzsimmons Army Medical Center there in Aurora, Colorado. But after that, after going through tech school there, that was munitions officers course because mm. I got commissioned as a second lieutenant. And then I got uh, munitions officer school, so I went up there, did that, and my first duty assignment was Eglin. So I go back down to Hurlburt, mm. or back to Fort Walton Beach, to Eglin in the 33rd uh, Attack Fighter Wing, and I was I was assistant uh, OIC in an AMU aircraft maintenance unit, uh, brand new F-15s. In fact, we were building it. We were we were converting from F-4s to F-15s, mm. and I was there for two and a half years. We did some neat things. Then I then I wanted to go overseas. Uh, but I ended up at Headquarters TAC, which is now ACC. Mm -hmm. That was another long story. But that was three years at Headquarters TAC, 
And then I finally got an overseas assignment. Okay, I, I started my master's degree when I was at, uh, when I first got to Langley. I needed to find another assignment overseas that had Ember Riddle because that's what I was doing. And RAF Upper Hayford had Ember Riddle. Didn't like the idea of 111s, you know, but as it turned out, it was the perfect time to be on F 111s because it was during the Reagan era. We had money, we had parts. Right. It was a great airplane. So I got there as the officer in charge of the 55th Aircraft Maintenance Unit. We were married to the 55th Tactical Fighter Squadron. We did deployments to Zaragoza, Spain for training. We also did Libya. Mm. Uh, I was there in 1986 when we did Libya. And uh, unfortunately my planes didn't, but my buddy's planes did. Lake and Heath jets, which were F-111Fs, they did the bombing, but my buddy's AMU was not F-111Es, but they were ef 111 so they were electronic jamming airplanes. His airplanes went down there, but um, so, so we were there for that. And that was my last act, and I left there, went to the IG team at Ramstein um, as a captain, and we inspected all the bases around Europe. That was doing no notice inspections were fun because <laughs> <laughs> you back in the day you did you had the phase one ORI which was no notice that was the balloon goes up what do you do now kind of a thing mm -hmm. and then phase two picks up where that one leaves off okay now you're you got aircraft loaded we're going to war so you you follow your war plan you do all your stuff that one is notice because you know everything is set and then you also had the they were called MEIs, UEIs, but they were the um, let's go check their books kind of a deal. It was, you know, it's not a flying thing. Let's go make sure they're doing stuff by the book. Okay. Unit, eva uh, unit evaluation inspection or maintenance evaluation inspection. They have various names for them through right. the time I was there. Yeah. Uh, but it was fun doing those, but I had a very, very good team I was with. Unlike many IG teams that most people have heard about because nobody likes the IG team. <laughs> Unlike those teams that went in to find something wrong, uh -huh. our, our philosophy, and we just happened to have a good bunch of guys on the team, our philosophy was can they put iron on the target? Does it matter? You That's know, wh whatever it was you found, does it matter? So the way we operated was during the day we're out inspecting. We're in the, on the flight line in the shops and inspecting. And, uh, and at night we're in the work center, which might be the rec center on base, but that's our work center at night. We take what write-ups we found or what information we found and make the write-up, but it had to be in accordance with something. You know, TO this or AFR that says right. do yeah. this. Had and they some didn't. sort of reference. Right. You had to have a reference. Or did it make a difference? You know, does it matter that the crew chief put his flashlight over here versus putting it over here? Well, if it doesn't make any difference, it went in the trash. Yeah. We got three reads on our write ups. When you put your write up together, three other people had to read it before it went to the boss. And a lot of times we're sitting around the table and Mike would say, Frank, what difference does it make? Throw in the trash. We were just, we were that way. And, and in reality, we really hated for a unit to fail because it meant a lot of writing. <laughs> and, uh, but we did fail. You know, there were people out there that there was one situation where we almost had to lock the gates at Enjelik, Turkey, throw the mm -hmm. key away. And within 24 hours, the, the DCM there was relieved of his duty and was on an airplane headed to the States. That's how bad it was. Wow. So it wasn't like we let everybody slide, because we didn't. Right. You know, we did our job. We felt like we did the best thing we could do for the Air Force and for the country at the time. Mm. So that was the IG team. Then I go to my next assignment at Nellis Air Force Base in, in uh, Nevada. Never really wanted to go to Nellis because 
But I'll tell you, that was the first time I had a four-year assignment. Everything up to then was two and a half, three right. years. But four years I was at Nellis. Three of those years I was a squadron commander. It was awesome. I had 100 airplanes of four different kinds. I had 750 people in my squadron. Mm -hmm. And or what were, what rank were you at this time? Major. Major, okay. It, it was interesting. I got to Nellis with a line number for Major. Uh, I was a captain when I arrived, and I put on Major, gosh, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting the dates now, but I want to say June, when I got there in 88, June 89, I put on Major. Nine days later, I was a squadron commander, <laughs> which in itself was unusual. The IG team thought so, too. Right. This was another IG team, <laughs> TAC IG team. They questioned my colonel about having a major in charge of a squadron, you know, as a squadron commander. And but we got an excellent. <laughs> so, but um, being well, that was my first squadron. I commanded two squadrons. The first squadron I had five different shops, including the bomb dump. And at that time, that was before Desert Storm. Nellis bomb dump dropped 75% of all the Air Force live munitions. That was then. <laughs> it's not true today. So you can you can imagine it was a busy it was a busy place. Because in addition to what we had with my hundred airplanes, when you had a red flag, there were another hundred airplanes in your flight line and you were supporting them. Mm. They weren't my airplanes, but you were supporting right. them. Um, but being a squadron commander was you know, there was a guy that told me that's the best thing you will ever do. You know, and I was like, really? Because, you know, in my mind, thinking of a squadron commander back then was like, well, that's some admin weenie, you know, and, and the head shed that doesn't have anything to do with maintenance. But I had the very good fortune of having a deputy commander for maintenance, Colonel Richardson, Tommy Richardson, who was very hard to work for, but he believed in his maintenance squadron commanders being part of the maintenance. You also have to do the commander stuff, you know, you do the Article 15s and those kind of things, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you better know what's going on with your airplanes. You know, so I thought that was great, you know. <laughs> and and that's really, that's, yeah, that's the, real, the, the way it ought to be. You know, management, management by walking around, mm -hmm. you know. I'm not for, one for sitting at a desk, Fridays, I would do no paperwork. I tell my secretary, I'm not signing anything unless it's you know hot from the colonel. He wants it today. Mm -hmm. You know, put it in my end basket, because what I'd do is I'd spend Friday. In addition to the other time that I was able to get away, you know, get out on the flight line, Fridays I spent the entire day out on the flight line. Oh wow! And uh, and as it turned out Saturdays I was coming in anyway, because my wife was working downtown Las Vegas on Saturday so I'd come in and by one o'clock I was I'd do all that paperwork by one o'clock I'm done check the flight line one more time go home you know and so I, I really enjoyed that and that tough tough colonel I was working for Richardson uh, here's another thing that people need to hear uh, APRs uh, airman performance reports, or now they're called enlisted, per, enlisted performance reports, or officer performance reports, all those reports, including mm -hmm. appraisals for civilians, too many people are writing their own nowadays. Yeah. When I was, at that point, when I was a major squadron commander on a flight line working for Tommy Richardson, it was June. I'm driving around the flight line one day and I'm thinking, I should have had an, an e, uh, OPR in April. You know, see, I, I didn't pay attention to that stuff. I didn't figure that was my business to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I had to go, you know, because I was really afraid of what this guy wrote on me. Because, <laughs> I mean, he was really hard. And so I went to what was then called CBPO, Civilian or Consolidated Base Personnel Office. <laughs> and I asked a young airman, uh, I'd like to see my records. Sure. So I got my records. So I go over to a table and I sit down and it was like, <laughs> You know, because I was afraid what Tommy had written on me in there, because he was always in my case. But it was a water walking OPR, and I hadn't given him any bullets, nothing, you know. 
he just, this is the way it's supposed to be done. He was my supervisor, he wrote the report. Right. That's how it's supposed to be done. Right. Well, in addition to that, one day I'm out on the flight line, I get called to the colonel's office, and they go, oh God. And so I go out there, and we had Tommy Richardson and um, God, I'm free, uh, Westmoreland I was the deputy, both of them full colonels. So I go into their office, and both of them are there, and uh, they asked me, I was supposed to be going off to uh, Air Command and Staff School, and already started getting paperwork and stuff. And so they asked me, have you sold your house yet? I said, no. Well, don't sell your house. I said, well, I'm going to sell it if I'm leaving. They said, don't sell your house. And I said, I'm going to sell it if I'm leaving. When I leave, I'm going to get rid of that house. And then, you know, this conversation went back and forth. It was like, what are these guys trying to tell me? And then finally, Tom Richardson reaches across the desk and says, congratulations, Colonel. Had made Lieutenant Colonel two years early. Oh, my So goodness. these guys are telling me this, and I'm thinking, holy crap. He's, and then they tell me, you can't tell anybody, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> it's two weeks before the announcement came out. Oh, wow. I said, can I tell the person I sleep with? <laughs> yeah, but you got to swear her to secrecy, you know. Well, so I've got this big grin on my face, you know, and I go back to my office, and the secretary looks at me, and she says, what's up? I said, nothing. <laughs> I finally had to tell her, you know, but and then she didn't tell anybody. But, but but all that hard work of it went on at Nellis paid off. You know, I got promoted two years early, and and I'm a maintainer. I got promoted over pilots in the wing. Wow. You know, so it, it's amazing. You know, people feel woe is me because I'm only a dirtbag airplane maintainer or I'm a lowly clerk or whatever. No, it's what you do on the job. Right. You know, so that was Nellis, and so what's the payback? Pentagon. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I don't need to go to the Pentagon. I want to go overseas again. No, you're going to the Pentagon. And uh, Colonel Richardson and uh, uh, Wes Moreland told me, well, neither, neither one of them had been in the Pentagon. They're full colonels. I said, how does this work? They said, well, how do you think it worked? We send guys like you so we don't have to go. <laughs> And then they told me, you'd rather go to the Pentagon as a major and get treated like a major than go to the Pentagon as a colonel and get treated like a major. Right, yeah. So anyway, so I go to the Pentagon, and uh, and every year I tried to get out of there, you know. But I did my three years in purgatory. I worked for uh, uh, General Eberhardt, who was a class act guy. He was a brigadier, and then he made his second star and went downstairs and worked for the joint staff. But I always I had him pegged for being chief of staff someday. Well, he was vice chief, and then he was acting chief between some other bad stuff that went on. But he was the poster child Air Force officer. This guy was just awesome. But uh, my three years in purgatory, and my choice of schools at that time, because I didn't go to Air Command and staff, I already done it by correspondence. And they said, we're not going to send a lieutenant colonel select to Air Command and Golf, or staff. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't do that. So now I go to the Pentagon, and everybody was starting to work on their uh, Air War College by correspondence. I said, why? I'm on the school's list, so I didn't bother. Why take more time away from my family? Uh -huh. <clears throat> but I did get selected to go to the Naval War College, which was my first choice. Mm. Went there because my daughter was going to be a senior in high school. Didn't want her to go to high school in Montgomery, Alabama. <laughs> mm -hmm. It wasn't a pretty picture down there at the time. And uh, as it turned out, it wasn't a very good picture in Rhode Island either. Because when we took her records to the schools up there, you know, she was a... I guess it was half A's, half B's, in one of the best schools in the country in Springfield, Virginia. And, and the dean at these high schools in Rhode Island looked at her records and they said, well, I wouldn't bring her up here either. So our daughter ended up doing her senior year in Kentucky, and that was our first year empty nest. But we did the Naval War College, and that was interesting. The people you meet, the things you do is different from going to Air War College. 
And uh, from there, my next assignment was, uh, you know, the personnel guys came and talked to us Air Force guys at the Naval School and said, oh, your records, you need to go join. I said, no, the only people who need to go join are people think you're going to be a general someday. You know, I'm running out of airspeed altitude here, you know. <laughs> oh, you got to go join. So my wife and I looked at, went online when I got home. You could look at the jobs. I can't remember what the website is anymore, but it was an Air Force assignment thing. And my first choice was NATO assignment at Ramstein. Second choice was something, but not really the attache mm -hmm. in Australia. I figured, why not? Mm -hmm. But pilots, you know, aviators get those jobs. But I got my first choice, which was NATO. Yeah. NATO was probably one of the neatest things in my entire career. I mean, there are a lot of really good things, but the things that really... When I was on the IG team over there, we inspected American bases. Mm -hmm. When I was on the NATO team, we inspected everybody but... I mean, there were, I think there were two times when we did American units. <laughs> wow. The rest of them were like German, Italian, Spanish, uh, Greek, when did when did you um, go to Ramstein and start working for NATO? What time was this? That was ninety six. Nineteen ninety six. Yeah, because okay. the Naval War College was ninety five, ninety six, mm. and then a little short school down in Norfolk, and then over to Ramstein in uh, September ninety six. Okay. Wow. And so. When I got there, I was in an office that had 10 people in it. We were LOMB, which was logistics maintenance branch mm -hmm. of AirScent, which was part of NATO. Now, NATO headquarters is in uh, Brunson, uh, Belgium. Somewhere like that. It's in Belgium. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> Mons, Belgium. That's where it is. Uh, but we were AirScent, which was a branch of that, was there was, it was Allied Air Forces Central Europe. Mm -hmm. There was Allied Air Forces Northern Europe, which is Norway and those guys up that way. And then there was Allied Forces, uh, Air Forces South, which was Naples, Italy, and all along the Mediterranean. They've all combined that now. But we were air sent, and in my office there were 10 of us. My boss was an RAF wing commander, which was a lieutenant colonel equivalent. By then I was a lieutenant colonel. We had a German lieutenant colonel. We had a Dutch major. We had a Canadian major. We had a Belgian adjutant, which is like an E-8. We had two German helpful Dables, which are master sergeants. And we had a chief, American chief. That was our mixed bag. <laughs> How did you communicate? It was all English. Huh. Yeah, see, the NATO uh, standard langu language is English and French. Oh. Nobody spoke French. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody spoke we, French. We did. Well, see, NATO or French, French used to belong to NATO, and they quit way, way back. You mm -hmm. know, the Gaul threw us out. And um, but we had a French liaison officer, a pilot, not in my office, but in the ops side of the house. Huh. There was a French officer there, uh, but he spoke English. <laughs> uh, but we we went to places that most Americans don't even know about, saw things that most people don't even know about. Uh, but probably the neatest, one of, one of the things I was responsible for, I was responsible for aircraft cross-servicing for NATO. Aircraft cross-servicing is when one nation services another nation's airplanes. Okay. Whether it's the same kind of airplane that you have or not. It's like the Germans didn't have F-16s, but they were, they were trained to service F-16s that landed at their base. Hmm. And there were two phases. There was, uh, they weren't called phases. There was one type where all you did was pump gas and kick the tires, light the fires, and get them out of there. Mm -hmm. The other kind, you did that, but you also loaded munitions because the idea was to get them back in combat. Mm -hmm. So aircraft cross servicing, you might have a Turk cross or servicing a Belgian F-16. You might have a German servicing an A-10. You might have a, a Brit servicing an F-16. I was responsible for that program. So we did training in, all over Europe. Um, 
But the neatest thing was in 1998, the, the uh, Ju uh, 4th of July, <laughs> we had an exercise in Sliat, Slovakia. In uh, Sliat, Slovakia, there used to be Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. Well, after the wall came down, they were, they were split into their respective countries, mm -hmm. Czech Republic and Slovakia. And so we were probably a third of the way into Slovakia is where this town was. And uh, I was the chief of maintenance on the flight line. I had 17 nations on my flight line. Mm -hmm. Each nation brought a couple of jets. So I had 33 fighters, most of them were MiGs. I had MiG-21s and MiG-29s. Oh, wow. The, you know, the Brits brought tornadoes, a bunch of nations brought F-16s, the Germans brought MiG-29s, because they still have MiG-29s from before the wall came down. Uh, we had French, uh, mis uh, not Mysteers, French uh, Mirages. Mm. We had Swedish Viggen, <laughs> you know, so, and then we had three transports. Uh, two of them were Antonovs. We had three helicopters. Two of them were Heinz. And so I had this mixed bag on my flight line. And I had a maintenance operations center that was representative of those nations, but we didn't have 17 people in there. We had um, a Cana my Canadian major ran the maintenance operations center. My RAF flight, there was the other guy I forgot to mention, we had a, uh, an RAF flight sergeant but it's kind of like a master sergeant. Okay. They ran the mock, but they, they had a, they had a uh, Slovakian in there. There was a Slovakian lieutenant colonel that was kind of liaising with them. <laughs> it was kind of fun because this major was actually running it. Uh, but the, the exercise was one of those where we're trying to train the former Warsaw Pact countries how we do business in NATO. Mm -hmm. We had to have we did site surveys there, and one of the things we had to check was, did they have the refueling capability? Yeah, they did, because the Soviets were set up to refuel and use our aircraft. You know, so they had the connections for NATO aircraft. Sure. They also had connections for Soviet aircraft. Uh, electrical power. They had four or five different electrical leads off that truck, you know, so they could hook up to anything, including NATO airplanes. Um, it was it was just a really really neat exercise. Um, they flew hard. They partied hard. <laughs> they learned a lot of things. I still communicate with some of the guys. My Slovak counterpart was a lieutenant colonel, and what was interesting about him, his name was Milos. Uh, his background was similar to mine. He was former enlisted. Oh, you know, nice. but he was an avionics guy, so he held it over me. You know, oh, you're a dumb weapons guy, you know. <laughs> That's funny. But it, it was a really good exercise, and it was closed out by General Jumper, who was at that time the uh, commander of USAFE and AirSent, mm -hmm. and so he wore two hats. Uh, so he closed out and came, you know, came to the, uh, the final, it wasn't a party, but final, the closing parade or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was kind of neat to have him there, but NATO was just way, way cool. And then I got selected for Colonel. After after NATO? Yeah, well, while I was in NATO. While, while you were in that, That's another thing that people shouldn't be worried about. I was sitting in a major slot as a lieutenant colonel, mm -hmm. and I made colonel. So many people are so concerned, you know, well, I'll never make Colonel sitting here as a lieutenant colonel. You know, yeah, it's what you do. You know. That's and, great. And so I got selected for Colonel, and then the next thing is I get selected to command a group. Well, I'm a fighter guy, right? Mm. I'm at Ramstein. That's airlift. You know, so I'm teeny way up to uh, RAF Larbrook or someplace, and my American boss, who's an F-16 pilot, by the way, calls me and says, Hey, Frank, unpack your bags. You're staying. You know, because I figured I get selected for group, we're leaving. You know, so my wife started her panic shopping. Ugh. You know, buy this crystal, buy that stuff. You know, <laughs> right. but he he says, unpack your bags, you're staying. And I said, but they're airlifting. He said, uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason General Jumper put me there, because he, again, he was my boss there as well, because he was two-headed. Mm. Uh, 
he put me there because I had munitions experience. They have the largest bomb dump in Europe. Mm. Also, he wanted to put fighter stink in airlift business. Mm. <laughs> so we did both of those things. It was a really, it was a unique ex assignment, you know, an airlift. Um, we did Kosovo. I mean, I took command of that group, and two weeks later, we were doing Kosovo. And, you know, that was Operation Allied Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were trying to help the Serbs down, you know, the bad guys against the good guys down there. And were, it was, a, fortunately, it was only 40 some days long, and then it was over. And it was probably the first time that we won a war without troops on the ground. Yeah. That's, that's And so amazing. the Air Force, you know, we can do that, but yeah. we still have to have somebody go in and hold the ground normally, but the good guys were holding the ground. Yeah. So, but we were flying munitions and equipment and stuff downrange um, to support the, the war effort. That's my part of it, was my C-130s were taking stuff downrange. And uh, we were taking munitions daily to Gioia de Cola, Italy, which is where we had A-10s. Mm -hmm. And the A-10s would fly over Albania and do their thing and back to Gioia de Cola. But the, the bomb dump at Gioia de Cola wasn't big enough to, haul, to hold enough munitions, explosive limits. <clears throat> right. So you could have one day supply on the, air, on the aircraft and a one day supply in the bomb dump. And then they were gonna load those the next day and you had to resupply. So every day we were flying munitions down. We were like the daily frag <laughs> support for the A-10s. But uh, when, when that war was coming to an end, we started thinking about uh, what are we going to do now, you know. And the, I was sitting in command post, the general sitting next to me, and then the ops group commander's on his other side. And the general said, we need to start thinking about medals. And I said, excuse me, sir? He says, yeah, we need to start thinking about medals. And I said, we've got the Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal. How about we just do that? And he says, no, Frank, you don't understand. You know, during Desert Storm, evidently, they didn't give out enough medals. Uh, right. And I said, sir, you realize it's going to be a food fight. He says, well, we're going to have to do it. And sure enough, it was a food fight. Uh -huh. You know. A lot of it was, okay, it depends on what your position was, what medal you got. Okay. And, you know, that just wasn't right. And then the other argument was, well, you know, our pilots, our C-130 pilots, weren't getting any DFCs, you know, Distinguished Flying Crosses. They weren't going to get air medals or, well, maybe they would get some air medals, but they weren't getting the really big awards. They weren't getting the Bronze Stars and blah, blah, blah. Right. The fighter pilots were, you know, from the other bases. Well, I'm a fighter guy, and I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, guys, those fighter guys are flying into the teeth of the tiger. Yeah. You know, they're the ones that are in there. We can't go in there with our 130s because we don't have a defense. You know, mm -hmm. we get shot at, we leave. Yeah. That's just the way it is. You know? right. And it was a food fight, but. Mm. And at my last assignment, Tinker, <laughs> I'd never been in AFMC before. And I figured, well, I probably I'll learn something about the wholesale side mm -hmm. of the house. So in, in uh, September of 2000, left Germany, went to Tinker. What a change. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I was in a depot where we overhauled B-52s, uh, B-1s, KC-135s, A-1s. Nice. Wow. Uh, it was very, very interesting. But they're so far away from the flight line. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the saying, keep them flying. You've probably seen that on different posters. Yeah. Keep them flying. Right. It's, it's always been a maintainer's thing, keep them flying. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was in the depot, okay, we didn't fly airplanes in the depot until they were ready when they, when they came out of the depot. Mm -hmm. So I coined the, the phrase, get them flying. <laughs> you know, and in fact, that's on a coin that we have from uh, from Tinker, it says get them flying. Oh wow! Because that's what we did. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> and when uh, when did you go into your last? When did you go to Tinker to your last duty station? Well, I got that? there in September two thousand, and uh, two years later, 
you know, I started thinking, okay, what am I going to do next? <clears throat> and I thought, okay, well, the only thing I haven't done is I hadn't been a wing commander. And maintenance guys normally aren't wing commanders. Right. You know, so there are air base wing commands. And I thought, well, I'll put my hat in, or put my name in that hat and see how it goes. And, uh, and it was January 3rd, 2002. Christmas had already gone. And I hadn't heard anything whether or not I got on the list. So I called the colonel assignments in the Pentagon. Some captain answers the phone. I says, yeah, I'm just checking to see if I'm on the list for Air Base Wing Command. He says, let me go check. So he goes and he checks and he comes back. Oh, God, sir. He says, yeah, I hate to tell you, you're not on the list. I said, I'm not shooting a message, messenger. I just needed to know. And so he told me I'm not on the list. I said, okay, fine. So it was that afternoon I went home and I told my wife, it's time to retire. Mm -hmm. 33 years, you know, time to retire. Yeah. Then I went and told the boss, <laughs> the two star, and he was, oh, no, 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 you can't retire, you can't retire. Even General Jeffrey tried to keep me. <laughs> but I said, well, what, what am I gonna do, you know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, so anyway, I retired and uh, took a job. I interviewed a lot. Mm -hmm. Took a job with Honeywell in Phoenix, doing military avionics. Yeah. So now I'm doing avionics. <laughs> there you go. But, well, <clears throat> we've got to wrap this up here. Yeah. Uh, kind of running out of time, but um, let me ask you just a couple of closing questions sure. here. Um, what is what is your general um, uh, feelings about war and military now that you've had your just immense experience with the military. Well, I, I think the, the saying peace through strength is the answer. Uh, I, I believe we need a strong military. Mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, if we could avoid any further conflicts, which is almost impossible, but I would advocate that we never get into another fight unless we had to. And we shouldn't do it unless we're prepared to win it. You know, what we're doing today is not winning it. We're losing lives. That's just not the way to do it. What we did in Vietnam was not the way to do it until linebacker. We should have been doing linebacker in 65. Right. You know, so we could have, we could have avoided all that. The most successful air campaign in the history of the world was Desert Storm. We had objectives. And part of the objectives were, how do we get out? We had an exit plan. It went in accordance with. We got out of there. We did what we were supposed to. We got um, Iraq out of Kuwait, and that was the end of it. A lot of people say, well, why didn't we go get Saddam then? That wasn't the plan. The plan was to get him out of Kuwait. Mm -hmm. And we had massive, massive firepower in the air and on the ground. We went in with objectives, clear objectives, came out. That was the most successful campaign ever fought. Kosovo was short, but it started to do the same thing that Vietnam did. The guys in the Washington, D.C. were starting to tell us what targets we could hit. And I talked to General Jumper one afternoon. I said, you know, this sounds an awful lot like Vietnam. Mm. He says, yeah. He said, this has got to stop. Mm. And eventually it did, you know, and then the war was over. But yeah, we, the purpose of the military is to keep us safe. And the way to do that is to show strength. You gotta have strength. You can't be a third rate air force. Yeah. Uh, final thoughts, is there anything that you want to uh, tell younger generations? Anything you wanna add to uh, this to tell younger generations that may view this? Well, I think, you know, each generation gets softer, in my words. Uh, <clears throat> my dad's generation, you know, the greatest generation, they were tough. You know, they stood tall. Nobody liked to do what they did. But, you know, to think about those guys climbing back in the airplane day after day after day, going into that hell, knowing you may not come back, and he didn't. 23rd mission, he didn't. And there were many more shot down sooner than that. But 
the strength and the courage of those people is what I wish we all had. You know, we, we have to understand there's something a lot bigger than us. You know, we're on this earth for not us. We're here for a bigger purpose. And you need to understand what that purpose is. You got to stand up for, for what you believe in. And uh, freedom's not free. That's good. Uh, is there anything that uh, you want to add that we have not talked about? Well, we've probably gone on way too long. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. All right. Well, thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you for your story. My and pleasure. Thank you for your service, sir. My pleasure. Thank you for yours. <laughs> thank you.